Okay. Then you may take your seats. You had to get up because the mind can absorb no more than the seat can endure. And uh, all of this good stuff that's been coming our way, we don't want to miss it because our seats are giving us some problems. We want to thank Dr. Crowder for that word today. It, uh, took some of us back to seminary, start thinking about C.H. Dodd, who talked about realized eschatology, which is only another way of saying God is blessing me right now. But we are in for another treat. Our second lecture, Dr. Allison Geis Johnson. Uh, a lot of you have, have gotten to know her because she's now at uh, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School and she's taught so many of these theologians here. Uh, when I first met her, Jeremiah Wright had us up in Chicago some years ago, I did not know of the chemical engineering background, but I knew that she liked to dissect the word. And so now I understand why she's so gifted in dissecting the word and nuance that makes her teaching so profound and helpful. I present to you our second lecturer, Dr. Allison Geis Johnson, hear ye her. Not a real church girl, but I, I do know that I should um, thank Dr. Riddick and Dr. Hagens for affording me this opportunity uh, to share with my beautiful brothers and sisters that uh, do the hard work of trying to transform spaces and places and hearts and minds. So. I had a dream early in my ministry that I stood before a large audience. And um, it's probably an audience about this size. And um, I feel like I was comfortable in the space. The only difficulty is that I don't know how the dream ended. <laughs> So I'm going to honor this space, pray that the dream doesn't become a nightmare, and um, just try to share a little bit um, of what I've been messing with and what's been messing with me, shoot, probably for 10 plus years. Um, I, I think that I never have a good title, but you know, um, and I, I guess I'll let me read what I like, wrote like four o'clock this morning because sometimes that's the way God gives it. And then um, hopefully I can shift gears, um, share what I see, and then get us out of here. On occasion, whenever it comes on regular TV, I watch a movie entitled Trading Places. It ain't deep, it ain't theological, but for some reason, at four o'clock this morning, it uh, was the catalyst for transforming this, what I would call, mist of study into rain. Um, the challenge with those of us who have been gifted to see and to think is to translate it so that it's user friendly. So hopefully this little something something that I'm saying about this movie is gonna help us see, you know, from the same place, you know, the high places will be made low and the lower places will be raised up and maybe we can get a glimpse of where God wants us to go. 
So as trading places as Eddie Murphy, Dan Aykroyd, not the best actors in the world, but um, Eddie Murphy's character, Billy Ray Valentine. He's a poor man whose needs are not covered by social welfare. So he earns his income using creative begging techniques. Dan Aykroyd plays a well-to-do executive positioned to become a partner in a brokerage firm. And he simply believes that he's gotten his position not due to privilege, but by playing by the rules. And for his efforts, he has it all. He's got a wonderful piece of valuable property in the right neighborhood, of course, not quite redlined. He's positioned for partnership in the brokerage firm for which he works. And he has even proposed to the perfect woman. Of course, on the other hand, Billy Ray, during the entire film, awkwardly has no friendships, has no relationships, has no property except for the wheeled platform on which he sits posing as an amputee in order to take advantage of an outpouring of calculated compassion that rarely materializes. And he sits there, over-policed, begging. Now, I've watched this movie a lot of times, but today, perhaps due to lack of sleep, these two men become the subject of a bet between wealthy brothers Mortimer and Randolph Duke. Their dollar wager centers on a question of nature versus nurture. One believes Billy Ray is who he is and he's got the position he has because he's lazy and has made bad choices. The other believes that if he is resourced, his life will be different. Just for a moment, as these men use the lives of another man as pawn, I heard Dr. Crowder a question that was posed in the 1800s when people didn't want to be fair. What shall we do with a Negro? Questions are often posed when people don't want to be pure at heart. And so for those of us that the question is posed about, we need to understand that the question is merely designed to make us run between two poles. Is it nature or is it nurture? makes us run between two poles. Is it um, conservative or is it liberal? Always setting us up with two options that both lead to death. I would suggest that the responsibility of the prophet is to offer a third option. It is neither as abused, second-class black folk that somehow help religious-based, nationally-oriented folk understand their identities. That's on one side. That side, never really saying it, but finding its ground in white supremacy. 
Kelly Brown Douglas does a wonderful job in staying your ground, just pulling that thing apart. That this group of people who have been abused themselves find a sacred text on which to hinge their whole reality in such a way that it demands that they violate everybody else on the earth and to some extent violate the image of God. On the other hand, is a political economy forged by concepts and principles from way back that is typically constructed by global elites who in their spare time sit around and create in their own minds objects of whom God has created as person. Create in their own minds objects of nature that God has created as substance. Create in their own minds systems of hierarchy to make sure that their perverted systems and imaginations stay in place. Unfortunately, when we look at these two sides, we tend to go to the one that doesn't seem to celebrate the fact that our bodies lie in the street for four hours while somebody's trying to figure out something. Anyway, the real fallout, especially for us as a faith community who's unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian, is that oftentimes we are systematically seduced into dividing ourselves. Because even though we can see the peak of the system, we rarely see the foundations of the system. It is the sole responsibility of the prophet and the prophet's peak preaching to ask God for the anointing of menescence, wherein that which seems complex is broken down into doable, gettable, and oftentimes destroyable parts, right? So as this people that's tossed and driven, oftentimes what we do is we find ourselves dividing ourselves amongst ourselves because we're not conscious that that is the engine for the thing that kills us all. In the movie, there is this division between poverty and privilege. In our communities, there is a division between poverty and privilege. In our school systems, there's a division between poverty and privilege. Even in our churches, there is a division between poverty and privilege. And because of the religious perspective that we have internalized subconsciously, unintentionally, we make space for the dichotomy. But what I want to suggest is that wherever there is poverty, we are Poverty serves as a litmus test to let us know that something ain't right, right? The thing that God gave me was that poverty is an affront to the God of provision. Yes, it is. We can talk about being black. We can talk about being white. We can talk about being Christian. We can talk about Jewish. We can talk about being Muslim. 
and we can fight each other on whose pain is the deepest. We can fight each other over who's male and female and what male and female means. We can fight each other over who gets to be married and who doesn't get to be married. But the very core of what is created is a poverty. I think Ruby Payne says there are like four or five dimensions of poverty. It's financial, it's physical, it's um, social, it's emotional, it's mental, right? So whenever we make space for poverty, and even if our poverty is masked as privilege, then it is an affront to the God of provision. So what happened in the movie then um, is that Billy Ray and Winthrop decide to destroy the distance between poverty and privilege. And with their efforts, they strategically unravel a system that has sought to disempower them both. Right? They have taken their constructed identities and the wisdom that they've gained from each of them, and they have put it all together to usher in a virtual financial apocalypse. The system that keeps them separated is now separated itself. So, I don't think I ever told you the title of what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> so I'm gonna back that thing up. And um, this like, I mean, I always get the titles last. So the big, I think, cool umbrella is a prelude to freedom. Okay? Because so, sometimes if you rush into freedom, you, anybody that's had any kind of situation where they've been oppressed, and like at a job, and one day you decide to put on a post-it note, I quit, Peace two fingers, I'm out. Then you run to a space where you've, gen you've gone from poverty to misery. Okay? And so I want to suggest there's a prelude to freedom. And for me, because I have two opportunities to lecture, the first movement is um, to usher in an apocalypse. And since I love the Hebrew text, and I specifically love Exodus, I'm at least in my mind gonna do an ethical analysis of Exodus through black girl eyes as just looking for a spot of freedom, okay? And I know that we theoretically are supposed to talk about the prophets that somebody else has canonized in the genre of prophets. Right, because we've been taught to obey. Well, I was growing, I, I grew up in a house where I was taught to love. And so I'm just going to disobey, and I'm going to look in Exodus. I, I've been given license by um, Dr. Warnock in the Divided Mind of the Black Church. Um, he says that we are supposed to give or operate using... Um, the hermeneutic of side-eye. I'm sure he didn't say it that way. But it's our responsibility as a community of faith to put together a canon of works that helps us to fulfill the vision that God has placed on our lives. It's what Dr. Harris calls unreading the text, right? If the thing don't work, then why are we collecting it in our theological garages. Okay, I was trying to be cute, okay. Okay, so then that um, the second lecture, because, um, because it's got to be what it is, 
is um, it's under a prelude to freedom. But the second lecture is creating beauty out of ruins. And from that, I want to look at the work and witness of Nehemiah. So for this lecture, I see Miriam. I don't know why her stuff ain't canonized in the prophets. We'll talk about that another time. But in the 15th chapter of Exodus, we find Miriam um, on the edge of the sea, having crossed over. And now she is an older woman. Um, I want to suggest that she's, you know, like many of us. Like her knees may not work the same way they used to work. Um, but somehow, she begins to dance. And she invites all of the women to dance. So while the men are singing, remembering the past, she convenes a prophetic dance, right? And I think what's interesting in this moment of prophetic witness, and I guess I'm using my imagination here, is that she sings the song too, which is kind of the destructive, the destructive or deconstructive dimension of preaching prophetically, right? Where we speak truth to power, right? But then there's this other dimension that's very constructive. Um, and it, it, I think it looks like the ring shout. Like my, one of my uh, mothers in the ministry, um, Reverend Sylvia Sartor, talked about the ring shout as a means of destroying the distance between heaven and earth. Right, because after you cross over, after you analyze and you see how a system works and you put everything in order strategically to relieve yourself from it before you can walk into the next place, we got to destroy the distance between heaven and earth. It's, it's the essence of the wheel in the middle of the wheel. As an engineer, I had to take physics, or at least physics took me, right? So. You have the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Now, I know I'm going to mess this up because for some reason, my friends who were not chemical engineers but were industrial engineers got done with their exams faster and they brought a bottle of Asti Spamanti to my room knowing that I have a physics final. So I'm going to mess this up, but if there are any physicists in the house, just you know, do like that right there. So there are these two forces. One is centripetal force, and the other one is centrifugal force, right? And if not, I'm making it up to make a point, right? So centrifugal forces happen when you move in a circle counterclockwise. See, that's that little thumb thing they teach you. When the, this, forces are going like that. And so something is now going up, right? And centripetal forces are when there's something going clockwise and the forces are going down. Yep. And together they meet. So when there's a wheel in the middle of a wheel, <laughs> shout the physics. When there's a wheel in the middle of the wheel, then there is an intimacy gained because we've availed ourselves to the circle unbroken down here. And heaven has met us. And so, while Miriam and the other women are dancing with their tambourines, the music that becomes the language that nobody has to interpret. And not only is she connecting to heaven for what next, 
But then she also joins the men in singing what happened then. The prophet is always in the tension of seeing what happened then and positioning themselves for hearing what next. Okay. So, you know, that's, I thought that that was like cool now. What happened then was this wonderful analysis of this terrible exploitive system, right? I know we don't read Exodus that way, but a new king <laughs> named 45 rose up. <laughs> and he lost his ever loving. And insecurity took over him and he found himself tweeting to his leaders in the middle of the night. Because for some reason, those who he had been taught to despise now look like his enemy. It's too many of them. I can't remember the psychologist's name, but there was actually work done, there was research done that showed that whenever there is one black person in a room, a person afraid of black people sees five. As my, um, as my 15 year old son would say, and we sing on the way to school, no shade, it's just the truth. No shade, it's just the truth, right? Because through this system, there has been some psychological destruction that has happened, wherein you wake up and you're probably a new king because you stole the throne through military force or let's just say alliances with another military force. And because of your insecurity, you decide that you need to have an arms race and you need the black bodies in front of you to build a world while simultaneously you take away every resource needed for life. in your feelings so much that you decide to kill boys and let the girls live. Because I'm sure down the road you might want to grab one. I swear I'm lecturing, it is, this is Exodus. But some privileged leaders, because we remember he calls all his leaders and he says create a system that doesn't look like a system that will destroy these people because I'm afraid that they might leave. Or worse, I'm afraid that they might become associated with my enemies. Poverty that leads to mental illness is real. And I'm not talking about the poverty that's part of a paycheck or no paycheck. I'm talking about a spiritual poverty where you no longer see people in the image and likeness of God. And in fact, Ubuntu is not part of your language. I see God in you. So I want to suggest that um, Shifra and Pua, that they were 
midwives in charge of the midwifery system, which is why they were called on the carpet and asked to come up with a means for killing Hebrew boys. And what did they do in their privileged position? They destroyed the distance between their privilege and those seen as impoverished by systematically creating a means by which they tutored the other midwives to create a third option. Oh, I wish I could move like Marcus. Wow! And in so doing, a baby was saved who would propagate the movement that God ordained from beginning, from the beginning of the foundation of the world. So, um, just so we can kind of do the deconstructive part of what it means to be prophets so that we can usher in this thing we've been taught to fear, which is apocalypse, right? Because we scared about the apocalypse. Ain't no black person scared about no doggone apocalypse. We got pre-apocalyptic experiences day by day, walking down the street wondering if somebody's gonna snap. I'm just saying, I, I hope I'm being faithful, I swear, okay. Um, but um, as an engineer, I, um, I don't believe, which is why it's hard for me sometimes to stay in the, the genre of the prophets, because I see the cry, I, I see the problem, but I don't always see a solution. And uh, sometimes, because we've been taught to spiritualize those books so much, then we are left with wony, wony, wony. <laughs> as if God didn't give us no, uh, let's get to it. <laughs> I'm sure I wrote that better somewhere in some notes. Right? The wony, wony, wony happened in the plagues. Right? But when we talk about a prelude to freedom, there's some stuff that God has placed in us that is enough for us to move from what's now to what's next. What time am I supposed to be done? I'm sorry. 15 minutes? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry. Sometimes the PH, sometimes PhD stands for profound head damage and um, and so what, what I want to do is kind of just uh, give you an image of um, how this system of what I call mass instruction um, operates that keeps us divided as people who are impoverished and people that are privileged, okay? And so if you imagine, um, because I didn't send my PowerPoint to you and my daughter who is a teenager will get me on Facebook, and hopefully by tomorrow, if you want to see what I'm talking about, um, she'll have that done. I'm an engineer that's like a techno dope. It's kind of a strange thing. But anyway, if you imagine an, an iceberg, and above the iceberg are three levels, and below the iceberg is one level, maybe two, you know, I'm kind of still working with this thing, right? So in every society, you have, in every institution, you have governmental structures, right? You have institutions, and then you have media that's responsible for cultural productions. 
And then below the line is the system of ideas that organizes this whole thing, okay? And so whatever that ideology is has to filter up through every aspect above the waterline, okay? Ooh, that stuff didn't come out. Okay, so I'm going to have to like, remember what I had. So, um, when we think about governmental structures, you know, here in America, we can think about all the offices of the government, right? So we have all the departments of, uh, we've got HUD, and we've got uh, the stuff related to the interior, we've got um, the budget people, you know, so we have all of those governmental structures, and we have um, the ju judiciary system, so you know you have you have, um, I'm trying to think back to civics, right? So you have like the executive branch, the legislative branch, and then you've got the judicial branch. Now, as people who are always thinking about liberty, we tend to want to take our concerns to the judicial branch and to the legislative branch. And we always get frustrated because the system of ideas beneath will always inform what those dimensions of the government do, okay? I mean, because like in the last couple of years, it's like, wait a minute, haven't we been here before? Right? Okay. So that there's that governance structure. And then there are these institutions, family as institution, religious, institutions, um, educational institutions, and financial institutions. And each of those institutions are used to morally tutor a people to participate in this social structure. So that's why we get frustrated with the defunding of educational programs not realizing that because of the ideology beneath, there's always going to be defunding, right? Many of us lost our homes in 2007, trying to figure out what had happened. We made all the right choices, right? But the financial institutions are put in place to maintain this social order, right? And then we have family structures that are constantly manipulated, oftentimes because resources are taken away. And so there's stress in the house. And, um, and so children have become too intimate with what trauma is. Right? So some of us know where we're going to lay our heads when we leave this place. And then some of us are not able to exercise our own agency to say where our children will sleep, right? So you've got this portion of the governing structure that now has created or is a part of HUD right, that has created HUD, which is housing and urban development, that Mindy Thompson Fuller Love, who is um, a psychologist who dabbles in public health, writes this article, two articles, one on forced serial displacement and the other on root shock. And what she says is, whenever you want to control a people, you move them. And so even though the policies are called hope, they destroy families. Because every time we're forced to move, it's traumatic. And of course, there's the whole redlining thing so that you make sure that poor black people will never live with poor white people because if there's an alliance, then the whole system falls. 
And so when public housing was created, there's the black projects and white projects don't even get mentioned. Right? So this forced serial displacement constantly moving families and what Mindy Thompson Full of Love talks about is the fallout being health issues, psychological issues, and ultimately violence becomes a language. So we're wondering why children and youth and young adults are fighting because it is the only way they get to express their trauma. There was another article put out in Johns Hopkins related to youth violence, and what they said was, you know, less than 2% of youth who participate in violence um, are sociopaths. The larger number of youth who participate in violence are those who have a dream who realize that their dreams will never be resourced. And so this system is teaching them that there really is no hope. Right? And what we're preaching to them is, wait for heaven. So anyway, there are these institutions that stabilize a nation while destabilizing people. And then on top of that are these cultural productions. It's the images that we are given to see that constantly tutor us, right? So there are these words, there are these meanings that we've been taught, and then there's this image that's been connected with it so when now, whenever we see the image, the word automatically inter is, becomes internal in us, and then there is an action or an inaction, right? So when we close our eyes and we think of criminal, we see whom? When we close our eyes and we see a smart person, who do we see? Right, there's this article that, um, Dr. Harris gives to our doctoral students, I can't remember who it's by, but it talks about how the, the real thing is then kind of made into a symbol, and at some point, the symbol becomes the real thing. So, anyway, so those, that structure, and what I didn't say was the ideology beneath it, I would suggest is an ideology of insufficiency. Dr. Goochamp did some work on the theology of insufficiency. But what you realize in this system is that it's never enough, you never have enough, and you can never be enough. And this ideology then presents God as a God of insufficiency. Right? And so even when we come to church, preaching what we preach, we start with we're just filthy rags because we have internalized this system of ideas on insufficiency, right? So our hair ain't sufficient and our skin ain't sufficient and our businesses aren't sufficient and our churches aren't sufficient and our preaching isn't sufficient and our children are not sufficient and ultimately our God is not sufficient. Though we give lip service, and so we're all impoverished, but what I, I just want to um, probably take too much time and then I'll just try to finish it all up uh, tomorrow. Um, is, is this, um, I want to build a bridge between this poverty and this privilege. And the bridge came to me in some difficult words to speak that I'm good, that I think God spoke them. And the words were, the word that happened to me, because <laughs> you know, 
when God talks to us, we don't just go, oh, deep, interesting. But that word like happens to you. That's the Hebrew understanding of the word came, right? It happens to us. But what God said was, my leaders have been seduced away. And now my people are vulnerable. Now the way that we are seduced typically comes in terms of debt and doubt. I think there's another one in there. <gasps> and desire. <laughs> right? So I just want to close with this that um, I call her Hashepsuth, right? But in the Bible, we know her as Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, what happens, you know, before Miriam is dancing as an old woman, Miriam is a young girl with the gift of menescence. So when her baby brother is being put on the water, she sees 10 steps ahead of anybody else. Most of us in the room have the gift of seeing 10 steps ahead of anyone else. And we have to decide if we're going to use that gift for good or evil. Are we going to use it to manipulate? Or are we going to use it to further the moment, to further the movement? I'm just saying, no shade, it's just the truth. OK. Um, but she sees all of this happening in real time. She's following her brother's basket down the shore of the river. And she knows that um, Queen Heshepsuth, also known as Pharaoh's daughter, and if we're not afraid, we can actually read um, the Quran where this woman is not only Pharaoh's daughter, um, but she's also Pharaoh's wife. Now, don't get all freaky about it. It is that oftentimes there is a daughter, there is a female and a male head to keep the balance. And if the mother who was the wise mother has passed away, then her eldest daughter becomes queen. Okay? And so what's happening there is she never gets to be married nor does she get to have children because her body is now an issue of national security. So she's there, ready to, she's just out bathing, you know, because sometimes Calgon got to take you away. Well, that's the part of it, but she's also doing a ritual cleanse, which is the spiritual spiritual interpretation. She sees the basket. We know the story. She gets the bat. She has her servants get the basket. And before she can think about what to do with this baby, Miriam says, do you want me to get one of the Hebrew women to um, feed that baby for you? Right? So part of even the deconstructive piece of the prophetic, it's to see the thing happening and create a third option. So anyway, now that we've seen the system, and um, now that we, we at least in our minds are aware of the seduction, I just want to give some homework. Right? It's, it's, what, um, it's what Dr. Stephanie talked about. Let's analyze our spaces for seduction. It's what Dr. Marcus talked about, our vulnerable places. Just go home and doodle. Do a free write on the things that you desire that usher you into participating in a system that destroys. Doodle another five minutes about your debt. 
not just financial debt, but sometimes educational debt. Who has formed you and demands that you set their thoughts on an altar and burn incense and make it your religion such that when you get up to preach, you can't say what the Holy Spirit is telling you because you indebted to a tradition that has walked away from truth. This is homework. This is just homework. And then doodle for a moment on doubt. Let's be honest about how we doubt. Let's be honest about how we doubt God. Ooh, I swear it ain't gonna be no like lightning that's gonna come and snuff you out. But if you're honest about these things, it will build a bridge of intimacy that transcends the law of obedience so that the distance between poverty and privilege can be destroyed so we too, like Miriam, can now leave a system, stand on the shores, and then calculate our next step to freedom. God bless you.